Good morning and how are you doing today? Hope you're having another super day. Today we are continuing our travels from Scotland to South Africa and we have just arrived in Morocco. Now, after we finally got into Morocco, got stamped, the first place that we went to, which was quite close to where we arrived, was Chef Chouin, which is also referred to as the Blue Pearl of Morocco. Because a large majority, or in fact nearly all the buildings in the old part of the town are painted this beautiful blue colour. Now there's lots of theories as to why it's painted blue. The most plausible is that it was discovered that blue was not a colour that mosquitoes like to land on and this area in the Rift Mountains is quite rife with mosquitoes. So that's one of the stories, the most likely, there's all sorts of crazy stories, but that's the one I think is the most likely. It is quite a touristy town, um, but it's very beautiful to amble around all these very unique shades of blue right through the old town. And it's not busy, there's not lots of people ambling around, so it's actually very quiet, but it is quite touristy. Um, so prices are a little bit higher. And we drove to there and thought, well, we'll explore there, get some nice photographs. We found a nice little campsite just outside the old city, set up our camp, and we were in Africa. We were in Morocco. It was fantastic. So we spent the first night. Uh, we got there, spent the first night, and uh, enjoyed. Next day, we went out exploring and wandered around this fascinating city. It really is beautiful. It's tucked in the Rift Mountains. There's some hikes you can do in the surrounding area, too. Um, but we were fascinated with just wandering around the city and getting some nice tea and starting our Africa trip. That evening, back at the camp, we're sitting around the campfire cooking and this guy wanders up. And this is going to be our first friend in Morocco. Now, Moroccan people are incredibly friendly. They really are friendly. They're very hospitable. But, as we discovered, they always want to sell you something. <laughs> now this guy introduced himself as a friend and came along and chatted and he was very nice. And he said, tomorrow I take you on free tour, visit uh, nice places, show you the best places, the, the secret places. And, um, you know, as a friend, as a friend. And, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, okay. So that's what we arranged to do. Bright and early next morning, sure enough, he was there waiting for us and we wandered into town. Now, when he said secret places, what he should have really said was all the places that could sell you a carpet in the entire village. <laughs> um, Moroccan, Morocco is very famous for some very, very beautiful hand-woven rugs and carpets. Um, and a lot of people make selling by bringing tourists into the shop and encouraging you to buy and they get a commission which is all fair and well, uh, that's their way of making a living. But we're driving a Land Rover through Africa. What are we going to do with a rug? And we're not going to buy a rug. And despite us saying no at the first 10 shops and stopping for some uh, nice tea on the way and then trying to do a no, no, we said no. It's like, we don't want to buy anything. We just want to look around. Um, but the guy, oh no, it's just like, it's okay. I keep showing you around. I'll show you another place took us to another place and also some leather works and handbags and maybe madam you know uh, no no we <laughs> i don't know how we got to the end of our first day without buying anything in morocco at uh but he was still amiable and still nice and he said uh tomorrow tomorrow what do you want to see tomorrow and i gave <laughs> came up with a, it wasn't actually meant to be a challenge, but it was going to be a challenge. On our drive, we'd got lots of big lumps of wood. And one of the things I hadn't packed, because I wasn't sure if I could drive through Europe with it, was something to cut the wood. But now it's in Africa, um, you know, these are big chunks of wood like this. So I said to the guy, there's only one thing we actually are interested in buying. Like, yes, yes, what is it? What is it? An axe. <laughs> His face was like, an axe? Like, an axe? <laughs> He's like, okay, what are these crazy, you know, they, they should be worried about me and I'm worried about them now. They're going to explain, like, a small axe 
that we can use for chopping wood to make firewood because we intend to bush camp through most of Africa, not stay at campsites and not have facilities and we're going to cross the Sahara. So we need to take a supply of wood with us that we can chip away at and make campfires as we drive across the desert. And he was like, you want an axe? And I get an axe. Rugs? No rug. No rugs. Handbag? No, no. An axe. Okay, he said. Okay. Oh. Hmm. So we spent another night at the campsite. It was very nice and peaceful, very beautiful area, but it was still quite cold. Um, it was November. It was uh, quite nippy. There was snow on the mountains that we're going to visit next. And um, next morning he came with an axe. Then became the second national pastime, apart from selling things in Morocco, which is negotiating a price. <laughs> and you must never take the first price that they offer, or the tenth price, and, the, and, it, and some tea and some arguing. And of course, he was doing it in Moroccan currency and Moroccan dinar, and uh, we were like converting it to a pound or US dollar, and sort of like getting his first one saying, oh, that can't be right, that's very expensive for an axe, you know, it's just a wooden handle, you know, it wasn't even a fancy axe or anything, wooden, a carved wooden handle <laughs> with an, a solid axe head. Do the job, but, you know, hmm. So we argued backwards and forward, eventually settled on a price, um, got the um, got the axe, paid him his money, said thank you very much, and so oh, we're probably leaving tomorrow. He said, oh, now we're friends, um, maybe you can come to tea with me this evening. And we're like, um, well, you know, it's just like, are we just going for tea? We're yeah, just with my family, just me and my family, because we're now friends, you come to my house, I'll show you traditional tea ceremony. We go, okay, okay. So here's, he come back, 5 p.m., and uh, we will then go for tea. He turns up at 5 p.m. Guess what? Straight to a rug shop. <laughs> this is a rug shop. It's like, oh, yes, my family's rug shop. It's like, the other 23 places you showed us were all your family's rug shop. You're either you know, related to everybody in this village or they're not really a relative. They're family, like we're friends. Um, but no, 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 this is real family. They bring out the tea. And while you're drinking tea, let's show you some rugs. <laughs> <laughs> and they insisted, and they were beautiful rugs, and a lot of them were handmade, and you could see they, um, the work that had gone into them, they're really beautiful, and some and very beautiful wool, and tons, but we could not buy a rug to put in the Land Rover, or send home, I'd say. so he ended up a little disappointed, but we ended up with an axe. So it was quite an intense first introduction, and our first friend in Morocco, so we decided after that to head to the hills because the Atlas Mountains stretch across northern Africa, basically separating the Mediterranean side of North Africa from the Sahara. And the highest peak in the Atlas Mountains is in Morocco. So we decided, and it's quite deserted and quiet out there, so we decided after all the hassle, not hassle, the hustle and more touristy side of Chefchouen that we would head into the mountains, camp, get some peace and quiet, get our camping organised, because we'd only just sort of started our trip. We're still sorting things out and um, enjoy some of the beauty of these beautiful mountains. And we did, we drove up, we, we were navigating in those days, this was 20 years ago, by the way, 20 years ago. Um, we had an old GPS unit, hold on, here it is here, traditional old GPS, not on a phone or anything, a proper GPS unit and a Michelin map. That is all we had for navigating our way through Africa. So we plotted a route that took us from Chefchouen into the High Atlas Mountains. And the road was quite twisty twirly, went through lots of villages, saw lots of local life, saw lots of local <laughs> scary um, vans and trucks piled so high with goats standing on the top of them they didn't look safe to be on the road. But as we got further into the mountains, it got quieter and quieter. Now the Atlas range of mountains um, are located on the northern continent of Africa. They stretch right across through Morocco into Algeria and Tunisia and they basically separate off uh, the Mediterranean side from the Sahara. So an amazingly beautiful location and the highest point of the Atlas Mountains is actually in Morocco. So we obviously didn't want to drive all the way to the top, you have to do some walking, but we did uh, go fairly high into the mountains, wended our way, went off road, 
and found a nice, quiet, people-free place for our first night of wild camping on this trip. It was cold, there was snow on the mountain tops, you could see snow in the distance, and the wind was coming down those mountains. So when we set up that, that evening, it was, it was chilly again. Um, but we set up a nice camp, and we rolled out our beds on the roof, um, rolled out the sleeping mats, put our duvet on, pillows, and then we pulled the tarpaulin and over the top and made a nice cosy cocoon on the roof of the Land Rover for the night. In the morning it was cold. I stuck my arm out. Oh, it is cold out there. When I pushed the tarpaulin back, I could see why. It had snowed on us during the night. The snow had moved down the mountain. No, the snow had moved. It, it had snowed on us during the night and our whole informal camping site was covered with snow. So it was like, push the tarpaulin off, take the snow off it, wrap our beds away, put on the warmest of some clothes we'd have. We hadn't actually come well equipped with warm clothes because we were going to Africa. We expected it to be warm all the time. Lesson learnt. Um, uh, put our duvet away. And then my wife, who is travelling with me on this journey, it's uh, her and I for this whole journey, she said she would like pancakes for breakfast. Pancakes. Up in the High Atlas Mountains, camping in the snow, and my wife would like pancakes. What's a man to do? Make pancakes, of course. So I built a fire. First of all, boiled the kettle, made it a nice hot drink. And then I cooked pancakes, using the Land Rover as shelter from the wind that was coming off the snow. And they were some of the best pancakes I have ever ever made. Maybe I was hungry, maybe I was cold, maybe it was something special about the area. But we ate our fill of pancakes until we could eat no more. And whenever I now eat pancakes, I always think of that camping site in Morocco. It'll, you know, one of those memories you'll never forget. But it was ideal. So we packed away and uh, headed through the Atlas Mountains, admiring the beauty. It is, is an amazing place. And it's uh, not very not very inhabited. There's a few small villages here and there, um, but otherwise, you know, with our Land Rover and all our things, we could bush camp quietly out of the way, and enjoy the sunset, and then huggle for the night because it was so cold. And that leads to these. This is a Jalaba. Now. As we hadn't equipped clothing-wise for really cold weather, when we were driving through one of these villages, there was this big market going on. And we thought, let's pick up some warm clothes. And uh, we sort of wandered into the market, which had everything for sale, from goats to fish to second-hand electronics to clothes to you know, fruit and veg. Everything was for sale there. And the people didn't bother us at all. Um, Moroccans are super friendly people. They really are nice. Um, they just love selling you stuff. That's yeah, just part of their life. Uh, but they were very welcoming and uh, we wandered through and took some pictures. And um, eventually we saw a lot of people wearing these and we thought we came to a store which was selling these. These are called Jalabas. They're the very traditional um, outfit, shall we say, in Morocco. Uh, it's a unisex, it's for man or women. It's not, you know, otherwise it's got sort of little howls on the side. You put them up, pull it over your normal clothes and uh, it keeps you warm, and they've got these fantastic hoods. Look at that. I mean, I can't see anything. I think it's supposed to, there we go. I think that's how you're supposed to wear it. <laughs> you pointy hood. Um, and we decided, hey, what better thing to do than to buy something that will keep us warm while we're camping around Morocco, help us blend in. I'm not sure blending's really worked. Um, and as a memory and a souvenir of our trip. So. We bought a Jalaba each, and, and they're really now. This one is made, it's very, very thin, but it's made of wool, and it really is toasty warm. 20 years later on, I've still got it, and it's still keeping me warm. Although, I must admit, I don't go out in it very much, really. Wandering around to the local supermarket in my Jalaba might get a few odd looks. But we enjoyed the market, had some fun, had some tea while negotiating the price for our Jalabas, which I believe we turned out something like. It, it turned out to be like 50 pence each or something. It was 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, but great value. 20 years on, still in perfect condition. So from the Atlas Mountains and our market expeditions and uh, absorbing a little bit of the, of the culture, we, we had no timetable for this trip. 
Um, so we had a 90 day visa for Morocco. So we fully intended to spend 90 days in Morocco. So we didn't hurry anywhere. We, and we had our own transport, our own beds, um, a lot of our own food and things. So we ambled off the Atlas Mountains and by this time we'd probably been three and a half weeks in Morocco just in that small area. That is how stunningly beautiful it is and how lucky we were to have this opportunity. We were going to take it. But our next stop was probably the most well-known place, but also the most chaotic case I went to in, we went to in Morocco, Marrakesh. Now Marrakesh is, I mean, the name that conjures up all sorts of images. Um, if anybody knows places in Morocco, Marrakesh and Casablanca, because of the movie, are two of the most well-known places. And it is an amazing city but it is very touristy um, and is very chaotic and um, you know thankfully we'd had a little bit of time to adjust to people selling us because we hadn't arrived on the outskirts of the city of Marrakesh we're driving a big long wheelbase 110 defender with sand plates fuel tanks everything strapped onto it we approached Marrakesh and there was these motorcycle hustlers racing up beside us on one side on another and bear in mind now I'm in a right hand drive vehicle driving on the wrong side of the road because it's a British vehicle but in Morocco they drive on the other side of course because French influence you know that stuff um, so I'm still adjusting to driving on the correct side of the road even though it's the wrong side of the road anyway on the correct side of the road for that country and this is motorcycle people like, oh you need accommodation we help you you need carpet we're driving into the city and they're trying to sell us stuff from scooters as we are driving in it was so difficult not to squash them especially as I got further and further into the city now Marrakesh was one of the things we actually wanted to stay in accommodation because um, there's no camping sites near the centre and all of the action in Marrakesh happens in the central area. So we had actually booked a room in a hotel overlooking the central square in Marrakesh, which meant we had to drive from the outskirts all the way into the centre of Marrakesh, right into the old city. Now, old city means narrow little roads. And with the big Land Rover, as we drove closer and closer into the centre, these motorcycle scooters did not leave us alone. At one point, we had 20 of them, all surrounding us, some in front, some on the side, some on this side, some behind, while we're driving along. Get, and the streets are getting narrower and narrower. There's people, there's goats, there's shops, there's other cars. And I do not know how I managed not to squash one of them. And it was almost... They were almost so annoying that I was tempted occasionally just, oh, jiff the wheel, and, oof, get rid of a few here, <laughs> a few there, but didn't want to damage the Land Rover, you know. And as we got into the narrower and narrower streets, I mean, it got so narrow in the streets one point that I had to stop because there was a motor scooter right beside me, holding onto the side of the Land Rover, driving a scooter, trying, which hotel are you going to? I can show you the way. And they go, no, no, because what happens is they get commissioned for taking you to a hotel. So if they take you there, even if you've booked and agreed a price, the hotel will then have to pay them a commission, which they will then put on your bill. <laughs> so it all adds up. So you've got to try and shake them off. But I was going down this now, and I actually had to stop, because otherwise this guy was going to get crushed between this narrow walls. Ah, it was a very <laughs> hectic, dramatic entrance to Marrakesh. But shook them all off. And what I actually had to do, I actually had to park the Land Rover and my wife, Jennifer, had to sneak off to the hotel which was on the next street and check us in while I chatted to all these motor scooter people and stalled them so we didn't get their commissions put on our bill. We're mean, aren't we? But anyway, um, and then uh, we had then parked the Land Rover because there was no parking close by we had to park the Land Rover in one area and carry our bags to the hotel but then we actually got this room with a balcony overlooking the main square in Marrakesh and it was well worth every penny we paid for it because Marrakesh in the centre there's this huge square which basically comes to life at night with all sorts of Moroccan cuisine delights being sold there it is a little bit touristy um, but not excessively so. And the food there is delicious. You, but we could sit on our balcony in our hotel and watch from the mid-afternoon 
the square was completely empty and then slowly people would trickle in carrying stuff building the stalls up setting the fires and then the smoke would start coming up and the flavors and the smells would start wafting and then by about nine o'clock it was time to wander down and walk from our hotel through the square sample and of course they're all great salesmen and they all want you to come and sit and buy from there and they're all giving you a little sample of this and a sample of that and you're eating goodness knows what but it tasted delicious until we found somewhere so okay we'll let we'll sit at this table and we'll have this chef um cooking as a traditional moroccan whatever <laughs> we had we hadn't discovered much about moroccan food now except that it's very tasty uh, they use spices and they cook very very well their meat is so so tender um, so we had a really great evening um, both watching and enjoying and experiencing and tasting the flavours and smells of Marrakesh, Marrakesh Square. It, it really is quite an experience. It's quite bombarded because you don't get any peace in quiet. I would say Morocco is not a country to go to if you want to be left alone. <laughs> if you want the locals to be continue interacting with you, it's perfect. Um, so it was quite a hectic evening. We were glad to beat a, a path back to our hotel, get a good night's sleep. Because the next day... Guess what? Somebody from the hotel had become our friend. <laughs> and our new friend wanted to take us on the tour of the souks or the indoor markets of Marrakesh. And after our first experience of dealing with it, we go, okay, so well, we're not interested in binder. We want to go and have a look. We want to experience it, but we're not going to bind. No problem. That's perfect. I just show you around. I, I, I visit this hotel. You know, I don't work for the hotel, but I help the hotel guests. I'm not sure, in the informal guide. Um, we semi-reluctantly agreed, and the next day we went uh, through the Medina into the souks. Uh, the Medina with all the narrow little alleys and all the little shops dotted around, and we started off with some tea in this shop, and in the very first shop, out rolled the rugs, out rolled... <laughs> like, it's like, you know, it's... You know, and they're very good at it. Um, and it is a worthwhile experience, even if you're not going to buy, although I do feel a little bad that we weren't buying, because they explain about how, if you ask and if you're interested, how the rugs are woven, the types of stitches, what the symbols mean, because proper non-tourist mass manufactured rugs all tell a story. Um, this goes for most rugs and things all over the world, and stories of the history or the family, personal family history are interwoven into each rug and each rug is particularly unique they you know you've got to pick them out um, most of the ones from the remote villages are handmade so they're not perfect and pristine you know they've got little flaws and bumps in them but they are absolutely unique and they tell a story in themselves and the way they're made from the different products and the different dyes and traditional Moroccan ones are uh, uh, from a limited amount of colours because they use natural dyes. The new and modern ones, the mass-produced ones, are the colourful ones. They are just made for tourists. Um, but yes, our tour of the Medina and the Souks was really beautiful and we, ate, we had so much sweet tea, it was like I felt I was going to explode. Um, but one thing we did experience that our guide explained to us was we were walking along and one French lady <laughs> suddenly went well, it wasn't with, our, with us, it was walking nearby, went absolutely off the end, was shouting and screaming, and she completely lost the plot. And our guide said, we call that Medina rage. It happens a lot. At, uh, and it's basically because you cannot walk around alone without getting hassled constantly. So we didn't know it, but we'd lucked in by getting someone to go with us, because then, you know, everybody else left us alone. The shopkeepers obviously came and greeted us, but none of the other people tried to come and sell us things because the guide was going to get commissioned, not them. But if you go and walk there solo, which I did do uh, the next day, you are just bombarded with hangers-on of people, your friend, that, and you just, and that you cannot, you know, you look at something, you just glance at something, oh, ooh, you want this? Oh, you want that? And it's like, you just want to experience and absorb it because it is amazing. It is just a chatter with noise and smells and... Um, the vibrance of the place is really beautiful, but you have just got people all the time trying to make a buck, trying to sell you anything. It doesn't matter what you look at. You know, it's like, oh, you're interested in that. And it's like, if you are actually interested in buying something, you have to be clever and sort of feign. You have to look at something else. 
that you can sort of look at what you want to look at, but pretend to be looking at something else. And so, sort of, ah, oh. and then they, they, oh, the price of that. And, uh, and you think, well, what if I, um, I don't, that's too expensive. What about this thing? And you, you sort of, you get to play a game with them. And apparently a lot of tourists are not very good at that and just get so annoyed that they implode and shout. And we saw it several times. They shout and scream at the people just to leave them alone and let them in. And the, and the Moroccans all go, whoa. Would you like to buy something? They just don't take any notice whatsoever. They back off for about five seconds and then they're at it again. It's, <laughs> they're very determined. They are nice people, but they're really determined.